Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I, I, Brother Mike, it's been like this from the first note, first service. Amen. Just an incredible presence of the Lord. Sweet, sweet spirit. Sweet spirit. In this place. Yes, sir. Healing. Thank you, choir. Thank you, band. And thank you, Lord, for the man that uh, leads them all. Amen. Hey, take your copy of God's Word, and I want you to make your way to the Gospel according to Mark. Uh, the Gospel according to Mark, and we're going to launch from the fourth chapter. And uh, by faith, we're going to finish by the fifth chapter. Now, don't get nervous. I promise you, we're out of here by 3 o'clock if I'm a Baptist preacher, okay? <laughs> so, um, we're, in a, we're in an emphasis called, Who's Your One? And it's born uh, out of a conviction. We joined this emphasis uh, that was birthed in the heart of Pastor Johnny Hunt, who we had the privilege of having in this helm last week, was that not an incredible time in the Lord. Amen. Um, so it, it was, who's your one is an evangelistic emphasis. It was uh, birthed in our hearts because as we began to understand the lateness of the hour prophetically, where we're living in the last moments of the last days, as we're watching the world begin to move into the spirit of Antichrist coming under a one world, both political and economic uh, control. Uh, I, you can see that happening before you don't have to be a theologian to understand where we're moving, the trajectory of what's happening in our culture. Well, part of what we believe the Lord is saying to us is we want to take as many people to heaven with us for his glory as we can possibly take. And out of that... Um, we are uh, asking ourselves, who's your one? And by the way, I just want to hit the pause button ever so quickly to say we officially uh, got word Monday of our first one from who's your one. And uh, in fact, if I uh, could just share with it, um, Galen Porter led a man to the Lord Monday on the heels of the stirring of the winds uh, Sunday. And that had, what actually had taken place was months, I don't remember the timeline, Galen, but it's months ago, maybe even more, uh, there was a lady that was visiting with us. Uh, she lives in, uh, in Alabama. I, Christy and I don't personally know her. She watches the service weekly. She is a nurse, and this is her church home. Uh, so she came up for the first time to visit her church home and was a part of the service and shared with me that God had really used during the lockdown uh, she had found our, our ministry and just wanted to see what God was doing physically in the room at Fairview. And she shared with me that her dad was not a believer. And she said to me, um, he loves golf. Would, would you be willing to maybe go play golf? And I said, uh, I, I will not only not be able to win him to Jesus, I will backslide and lose my testimony on the golf course. I, I don't play golf. I don't like golf. Um, it, you know, years, eons ago, um, there, with witchcraft, men beat the ground with sticks. They called it witchcraft. Now they call it golf. <laughs> so I said to her before she left, I said, but listen, I'm going to tell you, I know just the guy. And I introduced her to Galen Porter. And out of that, God birthed um, uh, an opportunity and a relationship for Galen to share the gospel. So we, we, we're, we're on track. Now, I'm going to ask you this. Who's your one? Who is it that the Holy Spirit has put on your heart to win to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? I believe this text will help us and equip us in such a way that when we leave here in a few moments, we will walk out of here with some tools from the precious word of God. Now, we, it is our custom, if you can, no guilt, no condemnation to rise and to stand in reverence for the reading of God's word. We're going to begin at Mark 4. Um, you you uh, will find verse 1 and we'll read to set the tenor and the tone of the text. And he began again to teach by the seaside. And there, there was gathered unto him a great multitude so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. He's at the northern end of the Galilee. Uh, we are told conservatively that several thousand have pressed in on that northern shore of the, of the Sea of Galilee, so much so they pressed in to hear him that he stepped into a boat, pushed it out into the water, and he's now using 
Um, that it's a terraced piece of uh, topography. That land is hill country. So they're seated like we are in this room. It just rises up the hill and Jesus takes command of the, of the natural environment and he uses the water to project his voice and they wait with bated breath. This man's teaching like no man has ever taught before. Listen to the text. And he taught them many things by parables and he said unto them in his doctrine, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass. As he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up, and some on stony ground, where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it out, and yielded, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought some 30 and some 60 and some 100 fold. Now here's the key to what's happening in chapter 4. And he said unto them, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. And we pray God that the spirit of anticipation, of expectancy, God, the spirit of faith that's been so real in this room would continue to have freedom. We pray against every spirit that's not in agreement with the Holy Spirit, that the worries of this world, that those things that would for a moment steal away our attention from the infallible Word of God, that in Jesus' name, they would melt away in the audience of who you are. We ask this in the name of the soon coming King. Jesus the Christ. Amen. And you may be seated. This is a foundational truth of where we're headed next week. I'm going to lay the foundation for uh, expositional truth out of Psalm 126 next week. So if you have time to read in advance and to get a hold of that Psalm 126 truth, it will will help you in the preaching next week. When you come to uh, the gospel according to Mark, we are blessed that we have chapter and verse divisions. Uh, You can imagine before they divided the Word of God in chapters and verses, if I would have said, hey, there's a place in the letter of Mark, can you find where Jesus is teaching, and he's talking about the seed and the soil? Well, it would have taken us a considerable amount of time to do that, uh, especially before the advent of electronics. So we're blessed to be able to have chapter and verse, but here's, here's what it does take away. It takes away the fact that sometimes we, we wrongly divide or divorce the text from the flow of what's happening. I'm going to submit to you today that there are some powerful truths in chapter 4, but they don't come to the apex. They don't come to the application till you get to chapter 5. Uh, let me give you an example. He's going to teach by parable, and he's going to say, here's some picture of the soils. In this room, there are essentially four types of hearts in this room. He says, first, there is the stolen seed, uh, meaning that when the word of God went forth, that there, the heart wasn't receptive. It, it just simply would not take the, the word of God. Therefore, when, when the word fell on that heart, on that soil, uh, he's going to say a little later in interpretation that the enemy sent the worries of the world, the concerns of the flesh Uh, perhaps demonic activity, and they're going to steal that word. Listen carefully to me, beloved. I I want you to hear what I'm about to say. When the word of God comes forth, we are not only responsible for what we do hear, we're responsible for what we would have heard if we'd have been listening. Does that make sense? I mean, oh, that's that's too good to... They're thinking about it. Let's, Let's say amen to it over here. Not only are we responsible for what we do hear, we're responsible for what we would have heard if we had been listening. So, see, we've turned church into a spectator consumeristic event. That is not at all what's happening in this room. We've lost the capacity to understand the supernatural power of God's word so that when it goes forth, we're listening to the tenor and the tone of the preacher or we're listening to the engagement entertainment factor of the sermon or the rhythm and the rhyme of the music and we're missing the fact that we are not here primarily in order to hear the rhythm of the music or or the insight of the sermon. We're here to hear from God. God. And in spite of our frailty, in spite of our humanity, what we want most is to have a heart that is, for these few moments, so receptive to the infallible, authoritative Word of God. 
Now, how do you know that? Because he's going to say very clearly, he said, now there is some soil where the seed is stolen. Uh, then there's some soil that is so shallow that the seed can't take root. Then he's going to say there is a soulish. Now, not only is it stolen because it has no, it, it's not allowed to permeate, and, and, and it won't take root because it's shallow. There's an appearance of godliness, but no power thereof. They know the lingo, but they don't know the Lord. They, they carry a Bible, but they don't carry the incarnate, in, infallible word of God inside of their heart. Then he says there is a, a soulish response. Now, now listen carefully when he says in verse 6, For the sun was up and it scorched, and it had no root. It withered away. When you and I came to Christ and we whispered his name in repentance, in that moment the supernatural took place. We were, we were translated from death to life. Our name was written down in the Lamb's book of life. And in that moment, in that moment, not only did we get a new name in the Lamb's book of life, but in that moment our name was put at the marriage supper of the Lamb so that when this moment comes that we talk about from the Bible, the rapture of the church, if you're not a believer, I want to put you on notice. Listen carefully. It's not a fear factor. I'm not playing on your emotions. But there is soon and very soon coming. No man knows exactly when or where, but there is a time coming when, when Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, whoever liveth to intercede, he's in a prayer meeting. He's praying for us right now. He's praying for freedom in this room, a receptivity of his word, an application of his truth that we might walk in the liberty wherewith we were bought in, a, in some season, some moment to come. The Father who's seated on the throne We'll turn to his son who's at his right hand, the place of authority and intercession, and he's going to say to his son, the prayer meeting is over. There's no need to pray for the bride called Fairview. There's no need anymore for the Holy Spirit to come up with groanings that cannot be uttered in order to pray for those who are walking through the deepest, darkest valley they've ever experienced. I want you to get up, and I want you to go get the bride, the one you paid for at Calvary, the one you sealed at the empty tomb, the one you washed in your blood, the one you wrote down in the Lamb's Book of Life, the one you prepared the marriage supper of the lamb and I'm telling you in the twinkling of an eye in the twink not the blinking at the speed of light 187,000 miles per second you and I are going to drop this bag of bones and we're going to rise to meet the one who redeemed us at Calvary's cross who told death to go right back to hell we will be in that moment in his presence and celebrating the fact that not death not hell not the grave not sickness not sorrow not cancer nothing can come against us Again, now in that moment, listen to me, the world will have an explanation. They're good at fake news. Don't believe me? Go home, turn one on. They're good at it. And they'll have some reasonable, rational, scientific explanation for why are these Bible-thumping, neo-playing... Well, be careful here. Keep moving, Jeffrey. Keep moving, Jeffrey. Evolution just belts them out so that we could become the fullness of who we are. <laughs> Cars are going to careen. Planes are going to fall. People are going to disappear. You hear me well. There is an anointing that is coming across this land. There's an urgency in the heart of men and women of God that will hear the voice of God. When you come together as believers, not just in this room collectively, but when you come together two or more in the authority of the word, you 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 got to listen to what the Spirit's saying. Don't, don't let the enemy steal. Don't be shallow and don't be soulish. Now, what in the world does soulish mean? When you came to Christ, you and I, immediately, we were fixed, final, done, saved. You are seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. So, I am saved in Christ. That's what happened to my spirit. I'm made of three parts. I have a body, I have a soul, and I have a spirit. Now, my spirit was redeemed at Calvary. My soul, which is made up of my mind, my will, and my emotions, it is part of the salvation package, but it has to be sanctified. This is why y'all act like you do when you drive in Fountain City. Though you are saved, there are times you are not sanctified. How do I know this? Because I see that bright orange sticker on the back of the car that says Fairview Knox. And as they blow the horn and send signals to the world, I say, 
there's one of yours, Lord. <laughs> and the Lord says, no, I think it's yours, Jeff. <laughs> and we agree. <laughs> Sanctification is the process whereby the Word of God, when it goes forth, it has, it has a transform, transforming power. This is what often happens in the American church. We gather information and we get up and go out of here and that information that doesn't have any application and then it makes no transformation, it won't be long until the enemy brings an accusation. This is what he'll say. Look at you. <laughs> Look at you sitting in his church on spring break Sunday. What's wrong with you, everybody else? Has, is down there getting their Bahama Mama tan on. They're all at the pancake pantry. This is, this is fall break. I said spring tonight. This is fall break. You knew what I meant, so shut up and listen. This is fall break. What in the world are you doing sitting here letting this sawed-off, spike-headed spitter spit at you? You didn't know what I was going to say, did you? This is what's going to happen. You listen, when the Word of God goes forth and you don't apply it, students, this goes through every Wednesday night. When Pastor C brings the Word, when Pastor Richie brings the Word, when you're in connection group and there's a Word, if, if you are not careful, you'll let the concerns of the world steal that Word that God had for you. You'll let the shallowness of your a relationship your, have a form of, but not the power thereof, and you'll let the soullessness of your heart just completely keep that Word from sitting down in your spirit, and this is what the enemy will do. He'll say, I don't know why in the world you're going to that church. You're no better off. In fact, you're worse off than you used to. Do you know this? If you come to church and do not apply the word of God that God gives you, you'll actually be worse off than you were before you started coming. That's the truth. Now, I don't have time to prove that, but you come back next Sunday and I will. Here's what happens. He'll say, why are you wasting your time? Listen to that Bible preaching. I mean, there's no, there's no evidence that's making a difference. Well, it's not that there's not power in the Word of God. The problem is not the revelation. The problem is the application. And then he begins to undermine the authority of the Word of God. And before long, you've bought into the lie. Well, I, I'm wasting my time. I, 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 I don't know why I'm even studying the Word of God anymore. And it's not obvious to the carnal. The, the carnal, carnal people don't get it. They can attend church all day long, and what will make them mad is if they do get it. Okay, let's move on this side over here. Three of you got it over here. It, 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 it's like the, it's, it, it, y'all heard about LSU yesterday, the football team? You don't know this, they lost. Alabama did too. <laughs> Tennessee won. Jesus is coming soon. I'm just telling you right now, okay? I'm just telling you. My wife asked me, what'd you think? I said, listen, we, we may not make it to service tomorrow. Alabama lost, Tennessee won, and Kentucky beat somebody. Jesus is on his way back. Do you understand what I'm saying? That I heard that when LSU got back on the buses and they got back um, uh, in, on campus, that their coach had decided to cheer them up, and he brought in a, a, a circus to kind of cheer them up when they got back from the loss. And uh, the circus was there on campus, and two clowns wanted to tour the campus. And, and the, the, the clowns fell into one of those Louisiana bayous. Sad, bad thing, bad thing. And these alligators were eating these clowns. And the alligator, one alligator looked at the other and said, this tastes funny to you. Now, y'all going to get that later. You're going to spit eggs halfway across the room at the Waffle House. There are times when we don't hear what we would have heard, just like then, <laughs> because we don't have a mind to hear it. Now, now watch what Jesus is about to do. He's going to show the, the, the terrain of what it means to receive the Word. Then he's going to tell them about the, not only the, the, the soils, but the seed. The problem's not the seed. Because if it's allowed to do what it's supposed to do, it'll return 30-fold, 60-fold, 90-fold. The problem's not the Word of God. It, 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 listen, the grass will wither. The flower will fade. But the Word will stand forever. It, 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 it does not return void. It will accomplish all that He sends forth for it to do. It's going to come to pass. The problem's not the seed. It's the soil. So there are times when God 
has to put the gospel plow, he has to put the spiritual plow in, in, in the deep places of our hearts because we've become wounded and calcified and, 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 and cynical. And we, we just think, oh, I don't know. I don't even know if I believe this stuff anymore. And there's times when God in the life of a believer, he will sovereignly put the plow. He'll put us in situations where that the word we heard, we will have to, we'll be forced to either depend on it or deny it. Now, how do you know that? Remember what I said, opening up. We're almost done now. We're almost done. Stay with me. I said that the flow of the text is not just chapter 4. There's a point and a purpose. Three times he's going to say in chapter 4, let the hearer listen. He that had the ears, listen. Let, let, me, let me tell you what he's trying to do. This is what he's trying to do. He's saying, listen, I need you to listen to what I'm saying because I'm getting you ready for something. I'm getting you ready for something that you don't know yet. And this is what he does. When you, you get to chapter 4, for the sake of uh, time, I'm just going to call out the verse. You write it down. You go back in your own private praise and prayer time. Look at verse 35 if you have it in front of you. Verse 35, chapter 4. And I, 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 can we say this together? And the same day. When? The same day. Okay, so watch this. They're not just gathering biblical trivia. They're not just getting a sermon. On the same day, this is what Jesus says. When he's through teaching, here's the soils. Here, here's, here's the picture of the soils. Here's the power of the seed. Boys, I need you to pay attention to what I'm saying. Not only are, would, you, would you get something if you'd listen to what I'm saying, I'm going to hold you accountable for what you would have heard if you'd have been listening to what I'm saying. So here's what we're going to do. On the same day, test time, you ever feel like God might, sometimes test you. Boy, it's a holy crowd right here, buddy. I'm telling you, there's a difference. God will test us to increase our faith. The enemy will tempt us to destroy our faith. So on the same day, watch, watch the text. Watch this. On the same day, Jesus says to his disciples, okay, uh, sermon's over. Worship time's done. Bro uh, br Brother Mike, come lead, uh, come lead the invitation hymn. And uh, uh, boys, I need y'all to get in the boat. Y'all get in the boat. And he says, uh, we're going to the other side. Hmm. Okay, to an American, this makes no sense because culturally we don't understand this. If you ever have an opportunity to go to the promised land and study the Bible, you need to go. It will change your life. When you get on the Jesus boat and you leave from the Israeli side of, of the Sea of Galilee to this day, there is a nautical line in the heart of the Sea of Galilee that, that navigators will show you, mariners will show you, we don't cross that line. Every Orthodox Jewish boy that lived on that, on that side of the sea had been raised by his mama and his daddy to never go on that side of the sea. You don't go to the Gadarean side. Now, here's why. Because there's two and a half tribes over there, Reuben, Gad, and half a tribe of Manasseh, that, that are backsliders. I call them borderline believers. They, they want to live in, in the promise of the land, but not the presence of the Lord. They want to pray a prayer to get out of hell, but they don't want, they don't want to pray to have heaven come down in their soul. They want the abundance, but they, they don't want the obedience. They want to live in the amber waves of grain, but they don't want to live under the, under the principles and precepts of the word of God. So they stayed on that side. And every Jewish boy that's with Jesus, when he said, boys, get in the boat, I'm telling you, now I can't prove this, but when we get to heaven, you're going to find out this is probably true. I can imagine that at the moment Jesus said, get in the boat, we're going to the other side. I can imagine that Simon Peter said, uh, Jesus, excuse me, um, I don't know if you know this. Okay, that's a stupid statement to begin with. I don't know if you know this or not, but mama said, we don't go that side. <laughs> now there's Jesus and there's mama. And Jesus, we want to do what you want us to do, but I got to tell you, <laughs> mama said, we don't go that side. And Jesus said, get in the boat. <laughs> now, they get in the boat. You know the rest of the story. They get, about, they, they get well into the journey. The night sets, and, and a storm hits. And it is so severe that Jesus is asleep. He's exhausted. He's tired. And I've had people ask me, preacher, how in the world could he sleep through a storm? He had pastored a church. <laughs> <laughs> He's asleep. Now listen to the question. Lord, do you not care that we're going to perish? 
You ever felt like that? Now, come on, be honest. You ever, you ever been in a storm that's so absolute severe that you've, 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 you, you've given in to fear? See, the problem is not the fierceness of the storm at this moment. That's not the, that's not the problem. The problem is not that these are well-seasoned mariners. These are men that know how to navigate. This is not a storm that they're not familiar with in that sense. The, the, the issue is not the fierceness of the storm. It's the fear in their heart. I'm meeting believer after believer after believer that knows this book. They can quote, they can quote chapter and verse. They have been born again for years, but they're letting the fear of the moment, the storm of the hour, they're letting the winds of cultural change grip their faith. Listen to me. You are a child of God. You have been bought by the blood, sealed by the spirit, robed in righteousness. We are not in this world forever. We are pilgrims passing through. And my hope is not the White House. My hope is not the IRS. My hope is in a soon coming king he stands straight up he stands straight up and he and, and, and listen sometimes he calms the storm and sometimes he calms us in the storm he says one word in the greek one word in the greek the english transliterates it out he says one word in the greek he says hush now i think he's talking to the storm and peter because Peter's standing up right in the middle of the storm going, I told you, Mama said, Mama said we ain't supposed to be over here. See, we're in a storm right now. I'm telling you, I don't know why Brother Jeff has led us off to buy this piece of property. We're in an economic downturn. And I'm telling you right now, we live on the backside of nowhere. I mean, it's not like we live in Farragut. <laughs> <laughs> Believe in God to build buildings over there on a miracle piece of property. I'm telling you, I am never in my life. Well, you're not supposed to in your life. And if you can explain the vision by human ingenuity, then it's not of God. Peter said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mama said, Jesus says one word, hush, you and the storm, hush. And instantly, according to the text, they are on the shore of the Gadarene side. Now stay with me because we're done right here. Are you with me? We're going to apply this. The Bible says that it alludes in the text that the activity of the Greek language, it is that when he says, hush, boom, they're, on the, they're on the shore. Now, what is Jesus trying to teach them? They started their morning in their private praise and prayer time with an incredible exposition, an illustration of the word of God. It's a picture of the soils. Some is stolen, some is shallow, some is soulish, but then there's a supernatural capacity of 30, 60, 90. He's taught them something that, a word of revelation. Will it make application and transformation? Well, I don't know. The only way to test what he's taught is to put us in a storm. Boom! They're on the shore. Now, here's the problem. They immediately, on the shore, there's a naked man. Okay, that's not a problem over here. There's a naked man. Okay, I'm just telling you, that's a problem. Okay? When I'm done with y'all, I'm, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. I'm going south to the beach. And I'm going with my granddaughter to her first experience in the sand on the beach. If you call me, leave a voicemail. <laughs> if I get to the beach with Savannah Lee and there's a naked man, we got a problem. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? That gets worse. It gets worse. He's not only naked. Don't look half all. All the patina people got that right there. <laughs> He's got chains rattling. He's foaming at the mouth. He's naked running up and down the shoreline of the graveyard. He, when he opens his mouth, it, the Bible says it's like many waters. It's, a, it's, it's, it's the sound of over a thousand demons who possessed him known as legion. And he's wild-eyed and shaking the chains. And he's naked and running. And Peter said, I told you mama said not to come over. I told you mama said not to come over Jesus speaks immediately. Those demons talk back to him and they recognize him. Isn't it a shame that demons have more sense of who he is than the average person in America today? Now listen to what he does. I got I to close this because I'm, I'm through fooling with y'all. Watch this, watch this, watch this. He speaks. Those demons ask to stay because they're territorial. Now I know I just, I just twisted somebody's lemon, but they're, they're territorial. Now here's the problem. That those borderline believers living on, on, on over there, 
They're in the hog business. Now, I don't know if you know this about Jews. They're not supposed to be in the hog business. It's prohibited clearly by Levitical principle. Jesus says to the demons, they ask to stay because they're territorial. Jesus cast them into the swine herd. It is the first biblical record of suicide. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. There's seven kids over here going, I don't understand. It's, it's the first biblical incident of deviled ham. And watch, 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 we're done. Watch, watch. They started that morning in their private praise and prayer time with the word. Well, Brother Jeff, I've never sat on the shore with the word. Yes, you have. You hold it in your hand. It's called the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word, the word became, became. You hold a book, that book, that book, that book is a representation of the word that lives. That one who inspired that book will live inside of you and give you insight and revelation you've never had before. You don't have to have the physical Jesus with you. He left the promise of the Holy Ghost to live inside of you so that when you get a word from the word, he started that morning and they, they got in a storm. Why a storm? Why a storm? Because sometimes God's got to build in the storm the faith we're going to have to have on the shore. Sometimes God's got to rock our boat in order to teach us how to walk by faith when we step off on the shore. That storm was not about, that was not about anything other than them dealing with the fact that the word they heard needed to be applied in that moment so that when they got to the shore, they had the faith to deal with the challenge. And see, the average believer does this. They want to they bypass the storm. They want to bypass the plow. They want to bypass the conviction. They don't want to be rebuked and corrected and instructed in all righteousness. They, wanna, they want smooth sailing. And there's never, ever a time when their faith is rooted deep and where God says, I got this if you'll let me do it through you. The next scene, he's sitting by a campfire. That's a sign of God right there, buddy. <laughs> Probably a pot of coffee. Well, look at the guy. Look at the guy. Chain, naked, foaming, demon possessed. The Bible says he's in his right mind. Got his clothes on. <laughs> Talking to Jesus. They get ready to leave, and it's a good sign this man really got a holy dose ghost of it. It, he wants to go with Jesus, and Jesus turns around and says, you, you can't go. I'm sorry. You ever had Jesus tell you to stay somewhere? You didn't want to stay? Yeah. My wife said, well. <laughs> <laughs> you ever begged Jesus in the name of the kingdom, please let me go? And he said, mm-mm, mm-mm. Because we, just, we, we learned last week through Pastor Johnny that the hardest people we have sharing our faith with is our. He said, though, you, you can't go with me. You got to stay. Can you imagine letting the one who set you free get in that boat? Can you imagine standing on that shore and watching that boat just become a dot on, on the horizon and thinking, Man, I'm going to spend my life with him. Listen to me. You get better than your life, you get eternity. I'm going to introduce you to what is called extra biblical history. We are told by multiple sources in this period of time that some, some 38 years later, Jesus had already prophesied in his ministry. He prophesied, listen, when you see the city of Jerusalem surrounded, when you see it surrounded now, you need to get out if you're a follower of Yahshua because not one stone is going to be left upon a stone. A.D. 68, the general Titus, the Roman army, shows up and he surrounds the city of Jerusalem to quell a rebellion and finally to rid the world of the hook-nosed Jews is what he called them. 
He surrounds the city and it's impregnable. Its gates are sealed, its walls are tall. And the Jews stand on the, on the, on the precipice of the walls and they mock the Roman soldiers and say, we are the city of God. We cannot be overcome. They just crucified the Rose of Sharon, rejected the promised Messiah some 30-something years before. And they stand in their arrogance and say, you can't come in. Oddly enough, according to Josephus, the oddest thing happens after they completely surround the city, Titus pulls away and leaves. He had gotten word that his father, Vespian, the emperor, had died and he was going to bury his dad and receive the crown. And the Jews applauded in their arrogance. Look at us. We're America. We're invincible. There was a little nucleus of Yahshua followers, Christians, in the city of Jerusalem. And they said, wait, 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 wait. Our Lord taught us that when we see the city surrounded, that if we ever get an opportunity to get out, flee to the mountains. They stood according to Josephus and they preached with, with voice and vigor and fire and conviction and said to the Jews, you got to run, you got to flee. And they said, you fool, look, they left. They know we, they can't get in our city. And the believers said, but Yahshua, and they said, you're following some dead criminal. And the believers all got together and they left. A year later, Titus shows back up. Surrounds the city, sacks the walls, kills a million, and enslaves another one million. Josephus wrote in his, in his history, it's the oddest thing. Of all the people that were taken captive in Jerusalem, not one follower of Jesus was found. Where did they go? History says that a little band of them got on a boat and went across the Sea of Galilee. They stepped off on the shore thinking there's no way we're going to find any kind of a respite here. They're just following the word of God by faith. And as they make their way down the trail into the city of the Gadareans, they begin to hear the songs of Zion. They begin to hear the songs of Messiah. And they knock on the door and they say, wait, 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 wait a minute. You're the Gadareans. You're the borderline believers. You're the backsliders. How could you know about Jesus? To which a descendant of the demon-possessed man said, he stayed when he wanted to go and he won us. And those believers that needed a place of refuge because one man stayed found a place of fellowship. Who is your one? Because that one could change a whole city. Father, I do believe you have um, graced us with your presence today. And I thank you, Lord, that across this room, you have woven together a fabric of faith from Hawaii and from Georgia with the Bostics, Lord, with visitors all over this room this morning. Some you've brought home. In Jesus' name I pray. When they leave here today, they'll be captured not by the frailty of the sermon, but by the awesomeness of their Savior. And they'll stand in awe wonder of the Word of God. And no longer will they let the worries and the hurry of the world keep them from the Word. Let their heart be supernaturally cultivated. Because somewhere on their way this week, they're going to step onto somebody's shore who is oppressed, broken, in chains, living in a dead place. And you'll have a word from your Word if we'll just listen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. There's an unusual sense of the power of God today. If you have a need, I'd invite you to the altar. It's not a magical place. It's just a place of surrender. If you have long sought a church that needs to be your covenant home, 
this is a people of faith and you believe God's calling you, this would be the moment to just come and say to myself or Pastor Richie, I, I want to make Fairview my faith covenant family. Maybe you don't know the Christ that we've been singing and preaching about. I beg you in Jesus' name. I believe he stepped on your shore today. I believe he's spoken to whatever's haunting you. You don't have to leave this room hopeless. You can leave saved by the grace of God. In Jesus' name. Would you rise taking authority in this room? Brother Mike's leading. Altar's open.